interesting to think about. So, uh, but today, if you did not know, today is Pentecost Sunday. It is 50 days since what? Passover. 50 days since Passover. And so in April, Good Friday, we, it's during the time of Passover. So Good Friday isn't Passover, but it happened within Passover. And so Passover, 50 days after that date, you get Pentecost. And Pentecost means in Greek 50-ish or 50 weeks. or There's a few variations, but Pentecost, basic penta, meaning 50. And so uh, they celebrated this. It was called officially the Festival of Shavuot. So Festival of Shavuot, it is to celebrate the wheat harvest. And so uh, in Israel, you have two different harvest seasons. The wheat harvest starts after this celebration, and it is to wait until the celebration happens. And then after the celebration, they start their wheat harvest. It doesn't take super long, but then they replant. And then there's another harvest in about four months from now. And so in Israel, right now, today, they are celebrating the festival of Shavuot. Uh, they have parties, they have uh, food, drink, you know, celebration games. They have all kinds of things. This is where you can find your, your spouse is a big thing in Shavuot is because you have a lot of families that come together to celebrate. And so uh, like, hey, look at there. See, there's a single girl. Hey, you single guy. They do that during Shavuot. I mean, it's a very big time. But everything shuts down. You know, like on Christmas, you can still go to Walmart. You can still, on these, there's three times where all of Israel shuts down 100%. Passover's one, Shavuot's one. Uh, usually, uh, Purim, it also shuts down the celebration that Esther did. They usually shut down for that. But, um, so they're celebrating today. But Pentecost came 50 days after Passover. And today is the day that we celebrate Pentecost. It's whenever Acts 2 happens, the Holy Spirit comes down and uh, empowers us, fills us, and really uh, some things change because the Holy Spirit comes. And I wanted to kind of talk about a few things. I know this is kind of a one-off sermon from the normal sermon series. However, at the same time, we believe as Pentecostals that the Holy Spirit empowers us to do all things. And so when you are reading your Bibles, and John 14, it says that the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance those things, okay? Uh, whenever you're discipling, it says that the Holy Spirit will empower you to go be my witnesses. And so all of that is empowered by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so we don't want to just pass over it, of course, but we can see how differences in what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament and why he does certain things in the New Testament. And they seem very different, and at the same time, they're actually not. But there's a reason why it seems like he does things differently. We'll get, we'll get into that in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 2, we read this a few months ago, maybe a year ago. But Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now jump down to verse 11. Both the Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God. We see in the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, fills the people. Now, this wasn't just the 12, probably. This is probably about 120-ish people um, a few days beforehand. Uh, they were 120 people in an upper room. And so we would assume that they're all also a part of that group. And so the Holy Spirit comes. Now, because it's the Feast of Shavuot, the Festival of Shavuot, all people from all of Israel, three times a year, you had to go to Jerusalem. Passover, one of them is Shavuot. And so tons of people from all over Israel is here. So, of course, when God wants his message to spread, what better time when everyone's already gathered together? Kind of a good idea. And so they go outside and they're speaking in all of these different languages from all of these people from all over the world, even beyond just Israel, Jerusalem. Because 
some Israelites that didn't live in Jerusalem would still come back to Jerusalem just for these festivals because it was actually commanded by them in the law. And so they would come, and then all of a sudden, Peter comes out, all the people, actually all of them, and then Peter kind of steps forward and speaks, but all of them hear different people in their own language that they know speaking the mighty works of God. Now, nonetheless, of course, probably speaking about Jesus, speaking about different things that he did. And then Peter steps forward and actually gives a real sermon about what's going on. And so these people are seeing this change. Now, the Holy Spirit's always been there. He's eternal, a part of the, uh, the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, You can call him Holy Ghost, that's fine. But the Spirit, the Ruach of God is the Spirit of God. And so we see the Holy Spirit from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the many waters, the Ruach of God. This, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters in preparation for God to make things, for God to, the Father to do things. And by the Father's decree, all things were made by the Word coming forth by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's how the, kind of the, the triune, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was all together at the very beginning of creation. And then in the Old Testament, He shows up every once in a while, and then it seems like he's not there because then all of a sudden he'll show back up for some reason. Well, there's reasonings for that. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, was active, but not in the same way as today. Now, actually, this is pretty contested of exactly why this happened in the way it did. But I do believe in 1 John 4, 13, it does give us some hint at what's going on. 1 John 4, 13, it says... By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us, given of, given us of his spirit. And in, in verse 16 it goes out, it says, So we have come to know and to believe the God love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now, God is abiding with the people in this moment because he's given his spirit. Well, then you can reverse that and say you're not really going to be able to abide in God without the Spirit. But to abide in love with God, you have to also have the Spirit. But at the very end, it says, if whoever abides in love abides in God, God abides in him. But here's the thing. What's the issue? Before Jesus came, we had a brokenness that the law covered up our sins, right? But Jesus comes along and is the Lamb of God who does what? He takes away our sins. So there is this issue with sin in our lives that prevents us from abiding in a full relationship with God. Therefore, abiding in love. Therefore, not allowing the Holy Spirit to stay because God is love and we can't abide with love because we still have sin. And so if we can't abide with love, so we have sin, we can't abide with God, then God, the Holy Spirit, cannot abide in us totally, completely. Now, you can go re-listen to that later, okay? Can't repeat that here. So, there was this divide from us and God because of our sin. Now, we all understand that. But I believe that is actually the reason why the Holy Spirit couldn't stay in people's lives. Because they had this separation and God cannot abide in sin. Uh, Psalm 5 verse 4 says that. He can't abide in sin. He can't abide with evil. And although people were doing righteous things, the Christ had not come yet. Sin was still a separation issue that we had. And so there was no way for us to get that separation fixed without Jesus. And so until Jesus comes, we have this separation that only a little bit of the Holy Spirit can kind of show up at times. And he does show up, but now that we have Christ, our sins have actually been forgiven. It takes away our sins. Now the Holy Spirit can abide in us because that separation is no longer there. Now, the Holy Spirit, what's interesting, he does a ton of very random things in the Old Testament. Very, very interesting things. However, when you start thinking about them, he does the same things he does now. 
except he does a little bit more because now he abides in us. Let's look at a few examples. Did you know the Holy Spirit makes people craftsmen? Okay? Exodus 35 30. I never thought about this before. Exodus 35 30. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel. Let's go with it. And the son of Uriah, son of Hur, and the tribe of Judah, and of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, that is the Ruach, the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze, and cutting stones for setting, and carving wood for work, and every skilled craft. Now, to give you some, con some context, this is the guy who was over the general project of the, of the tabernacle and uh, working with all the metals, the bronze, the gold to make the Ark of the Covenant, to make the laver, to make the altar of incense, the showbread table, the candlestick. And so this guy, the zealot, the, that's, the, that guy, he uh, was in charge of all that. But the Bible says the Spirit of God actually came into him to give him that kind of knowledge to be able to do that. Now, he may have worked in Egypt, whatever, he could have already been down that path, but regardless, the Holy Spirit of God helped him understand the designs for the temple, okay? Uh, I, the, only, the closest thing I could come to that is whenever I started learning guitar. So I haven't played guitar forever. I started learning guitar when I was about 22 years old. So in all respects, it really is not very long. Uh, all of my friends, they played guitar super early. I was always musical as far as singing, but I never played an instrument until about 22 years of age. And a youth pastor that I interned at, who eventually moved to Colorado when I interned him, that guy, was at my church for about a year and a half. And he showed up, and the previous youth pastor had moved on. And all of the youth band at that time kind of went to college or moved on or moved out of state, like all within like two weeks. And within one week, two weeks after that, he just had no band. So he asked me, he said, hey, you know, you sing. I was doing a, a thing, uh, singing at a little festival. He said, hey, you sing, you play guitar. And I told him, I said, I probably could learn. Now, that is a terrible thing to say. Because I have no idea if I can learn how to play the guitar. But what I did is I borrowed someone's guitar. And I had one guy who really played guitar sit down with me. He says, hey, can you teach me how to teach myself? And I did that. I got a book, and it showed me the chords, and I put my chords, string, and then I would move my physical fingers to help do that. In six weeks, I played my first worship set. Six weeks of time. And then after that, I really saw, okay, maybe I have a talent for this, and I got into it, and I kept on learning. And that's how I started playing guitar, it was by a necessity of a pastor asking me, hey, can you play guitar? Not yet. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit... Through his guidance, through his power, through his instruction, his leading. Guess what? I have, people, I have played guitar so many places and so many times. It has come in help. It, it has come to help me in so many situations. I played guitar for a group yesterday because someone at a very last minute backed out, and so I said, "Sure, I'll get up there and play some." And so it has helped me, and I believe that the Holy Spirit guided me to that. So whatever. You may be going through whatever maybe craftsmanship that you maybe have. Maybe some of you know an example. Maybe I think the Lord has done this in my life. He can make you a craftsman of some sort of some skill, and it's just his work. I don't know why, but he does it. And then he can uh, speak to God. Ezekiel chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes, and he anoints people to speak for God on God's behalf to the people. In Ezekiel chapter 2, he said, he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, this is Ezekiel talking, as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. Now, of course, this is the easier one because... Prophets were obviously speakers for God. However, the prophets weren't speakers for God just because he chose, hey, you come speak for me a little bit, okay? No, he, he inspired them, and specifically with Ezekiel, it says, I believe it does, did it with many others, but 
with Ezekiel specifically, we see the Holy Spirit coming and inspiring him to go speak to the people. Isaiah kind of has the same concept in a little different way, but it's still some kind of direct inspiration from God. But the Holy Spirit is giving words to speak. This is the way uh, the New Testament is written. It's the way the Old Testament is written. The Holy Spirit came upon people specifically like Paul, Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, James, you know, John. And he inspires them what to write down and what they wrote down. We have discovered the manuscripts to be inspired. We put it in the New Testament. That's how we kind of get our Bibles. And so he inspires us. He speaks for God. He anoints people to speak for God. And then one of the last ones is in Judges 15. Feats of strength. We know this one, right? In Judges 15, Samson, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became like as flax that has caught fire. And his bounds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. And he put out his hand and took it. And with it he struck 1,000 men. Now, that's insane. I don't think that's probably the norm for today. To kill 1,000 people by the Spirit of God. However... In moments of absolute necessity, the Holy Spirit has empowered people to do things they just simply can't do by themselves. Now what's wild is Samson's probably one of the craziest examples of the Holy Spirit coming again and again and again. Almost everything Samson does, the Holy Spirit says it rushes upon him or it comes upon him. Whenever he was at the gates of the city, he, they wouldn't let him in. They thought their city was safe by these huge wooden gates. It said the Spirit of God rushed upon him. He rips out the city doors. This is not like a door. This is not a wooden door. This is the city gates, and he brings them on his back all the way up to the castle or the, the, the temple, the, the, where the king lived. I can't think of what I was trying to say. Uh, palace, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. And he rushes upon him and empowers him to do these amazing feats. And then sometimes even it says, and then the Spirit left. After everything's kind of calm, and it's okay, and everyone's kind of relaxed, it says that the Spirit left. This happened um, in Saul. Uh, Saul, the, over King David, King Saul, uh, the Spirit of God rushes upon him. Uh, he prophesies at one point, and then the Spirit of God leaves him, and then the Spirit of God comes upon David to do certain things. We see this all throughout. We know the Spirit of God speaks to Samuel directly. He speaks to Isaiah directly, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all these people, and but even feats of strength. So we have craftsmanship, teaches them skills. The Holy Spirit speaks um, uh, through us on behalf of God to people. He gives amazing strength or just feats uh, in general. Uh, we know that Elijah, uh, for instance, we just read that the other day. Otto just cracked up laughing. But we read where Elijah, the Spirit of God, it said the Spirit of God gave Elijah strength, and it, he was able to outrun the chariot to the city. Uh, the king Ahab, Jezebel, king Ahab, was going to go run back to his city to say, hey, we prayed to Baal, and that's why the rains showed up again when Elijah prayed for the rains to continue. And, and he ran back faster than the chariot, somehow supernaturally, and he was able to say, hey, our God, is, the God of Israel, has restored the rain. We know in Philip, with the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip was talking with the Ethiopian eunuch. He led him to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, Philip was found somewhere else. And that location is roughly, if you remember, about 60-something miles away. And so I don't know if he was trans translated there. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit can do a lot of incredible, powerful things. So, why doesn't he do that today? Well, actually, he does. It's slightly different, but I'm going to show you a few moments where he actually does do all of that today. Some of the emphasis are a little different, but you're going to see it. In uh, John 14, 17, we see two different verses. Actually, I don't know if I have that on there. No, I'm just going to read those. 
The Holy Spirit comes, uh, John 14, 17 and 14, 26. We're just going to read those for you. Even the Spirit of truth, he dwells with you and will be with you. Okay, at some point, well, when you, well, not at some point, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into you, all right, and he dwells inside of you. So the Holy Spirit's inside of you. So, you know, like open up your heart and let Jesus inside. Actually, it's the Holy Spirit. But so you get that right, right? But the Holy Spirit, once in the Old Testament, he couldn't abide forever. He would abide just for a little while to do something amazing, and then he would leave. And then we see later on he would come back. And then he would leave again. He'd come back because of the sin issue that we have, right? Well, now in John 14, I encourage you to read that total passage. But John 14 says, even the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, there's a significant part for this. I'll explain in a moment. And then in verse 26, it goes on and says, he'll bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So whenever you're in conversations and something kind of pops into your mind, that's the Holy Spirit working in your life to help you remember certain scriptures or passages or something encouraging to say to that person. He does a whole bunch of things in uh, John 14 and John 16, both kind of go into pretty good detail about what the Holy Spirit does. But I wanted to point out a few other things that he does. And they're very significant. More significant than we even probably would realize. And in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In him... You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit, when he comes inside of you, that is the guarantee of your inheritance of eternal life. Now, clearly, until you acquire full possession of it, as in you die, okay? You're in heaven with God. You're with him face to face. But he is the guarantee until you are there. And so the people of God going to the temple for sacrifices over and over and over. Hebrews says that Jesus came once for all and to make one sacrifice for our sins. And then when you receive those, that forgiveness, the Holy Spirit enters you and all of a sudden you are changed. You're, you're just changed. You're radically different in every single way. Well, what about those people who fall away? That's honestly a different conversation that we can have. However, there's true repentance, and then there is also false repentance. You just have to accept that fact. There is false repentance. There are people who will come to church, and they have not really repented of sins. They come to church. It's cultural. They like it. All their friends go there. They want to get the potluck, the free macaroni and cheese. Whatever the situation is, there are people who are not actual converts. And I, I don't say that to scare you. I say that to let you understand that is a reality. Jesus talked about even the false teachers himself. He said that they left us because they were not of us. And they left us so that you may know they were never of us. But if they were with us, they would have continued with us. And so I believe that a saint, a saint will persevere. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you will persevere to the end. He will keep you, as John chapter 6 says. And although you may struggle at times, that's kind of a different idea than just turning away or never repenting. There are struggles in the Christian walk, because your flesh is very real still. But the Holy Spirit is our guarantee until we acquire full possession of salvation in heaven with God, Him face to face with us, perfect forever. That is a powerful, powerful statement to me. Because we are the, the only religion that even has that concept. Do you realize that? For instance, if, you, if you're of another religion, you can do everything right. There are many religions out there. Islam is one. You can do everything perfect down to the T. That does not guarantee you're going to enter heaven. It does not guarantee. It puts you ahead of a lot of people. It gets you on the nice list. But that does not guarantee 
anything, uh, Muhammad, or sorry, Allah, can just simply reject you. You do all five tests of faith. See, our God is not like that. He says, you come to me, you who are weak, who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will give you rest. John chapter 6, he says, I will not lose anyone the Father has given to me. Will not lose them. I come to do the will of the one who sent me. The will of him, of the one who sent me, is that I should raise them up on the last day. Christ is going to fulfill his purpose. I believe that 100%. This guarantee is a powerful reminder of the love that God has for us and the uniqueness of our God. Guess what? That wasn't possible until the Holy Spirit came. It wasn't possible. It was, you're just kind of floating and hopefully you did the right sacrifices at the right time. Hopefully you were righteous enough before Jesus comes. But now after Jesus, we can have assurance of our salvation. That's a good thing. Now, one thing that he does in John chapter 16, this is one of the biggest ones that we kind of underestimate how powerful it can be. John chapter 16 says, nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, this is greatly underestimated, the power of this, for several reasons. Okay? First off, he will convict the world of sin. That's including us. We are not of this world, but we're still in the world. He convicts us also of sin. Well, think back to the Old Testament. Think back to all of the times we see Israel living for God, and the next king comes along, and no one lives for God anymore. And then the next king comes along, and they're okay. And then that son usually drives them all away. And then the next king, they're good. And then the next king, they're bad. And then it continues on and on. Think about the judges, just the book of Judges. They, I can't remember the exact number. But uh, the people of Israel flip-flop like 15 times. There's like 15 judges. They flip-flop. This one will serve, and then they'll forget about the Lord. Then that one will come back and redeem them. And then they'll serve the Lord for the while. And then they'll forget about the Lord. There's a constant going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between loving the Lord and worshiping other gods. Why is that? Have you ever wondered that? Why could they never just get it right for two generations? Give me two generations, and that would have been great. Well, guess what? They didn't have the Holy Spirit convicting them of sin. They didn't have that. Now think of the implications that that actually entails. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. But you don't have the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin. You just know in your, you know, uh, 4,000 year ago Jewish mind, okay? You just know that when you sin, this list of 613 rules, when you break one, you have to go make a sacrifice to the priest. That is your duty. Now, you get your dove, you get your goat, you get your lamb, you get your cow, whatever it is. You get your grain, you go make a sacrifice and say, hey, I'm good again. But immediately, there is still no Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. The people, if you notice in the Old Testament, when did they come back to the Lord? When did they come back to the Lord? It's one thing. Someone was oppressing them. Every time. Or God immediately judged them. I guess that's technically two, but they were being oppressed by an enemy people, and they finally called out to the Lord because their, their women were getting captured, their men were being killed, their children were being turned into slaves. And they said, Lord, why are you doing this to us? And he finally sends a savior, somehow a judge, a king, a great general, and then they get out of it. Well, then it says they forgot the Lord their God, 
and started serving the Baals. Again and again and again and again. Either the judges or the kings, all throughout the prophets, it's the same story over and over again. And so we have this narrative that is continual that when someone is starting to hurt them, they come to the Lord. But until then, they kind of are doing what they're doing. Think about the judges. Sometimes these people were in captivity. I mean, I think the longest one was for an entire generation of 40 years. They were in the promised land that God gave them. And yet they were being oppressed by their enemy. And it says it's because they went off and served the other God. You would think at some point, you're like, hey, didn't like the last 30, like 30 years ago, we were in perfect peace. Yeah, yeah, we were. Like no one was here. What were we doing back then? Oh, we were serving the God of Israel that brought us into the land that we conquered the entire nation. He said he would give to our fathers Abraham and he fulfilled all the things that he said. No, that can't be it. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's how they were thinking. And yet, now the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost started it, but now it happens. He will convict the world of sin. Now, when we as people of God come into a situation that's not holy or unrighteous, whatever, we say, oh, I shouldn't do that. And we either do two things. We say, nope, I'm not going to do that, and we turn to Christ. Or we say, well, just a little bit, and then we stumble and fall, and then we feel bad. You know when you feel bad? That is the Holy Spirit working in you, convicting you of your sin. The Spirit of God saying, hey, you know you shouldn't have done that. Your flesh is too strong. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is very weak. You need to build up a resistance to temptation, looking to Christ, running to his word. Every time you have a some type of temptation, every time you have a temptation to look at stuff you shouldn't, to listen to stuff you shouldn't, to share in gossip that you know you shouldn't, to hear this little bit of rumor and ah, I could tell a bigger story, I could lie. I can cheat, I can steal. All you do, you run to temptation. You seek God. You turn to him. You resist the devil and he will flee. How do you seek God? You turn this over. Every time I'm in a, in a temptation, this is what I do. I open up my Bibles to Psalm. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me. Lest if you be silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. When I cry to you for help, when I lift up the hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Guess what? Okay, I'm done with that passage. I still feel tempted. Do you know what I did? I just open it back up, Miss Karen. Open it back up. And I say, hmm, I'm tempted. I don't want to be tempted. For he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And then I shut my Bible. But Miss Karen, the temptation is still there. What do you do? You open up your Bible again. You open up your Bible and it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth has passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And guess what? At some point, when I close it, I'm thinking of all the goodness of the Lord instead of that temptation. That wicked, evil, sinful, disgusting temptation. Satan, how dare you? I've been bought with a price. Yes. I'm waiting to see the new heavens and new earth. God is going to wipe away every tear from my eye. There will be death no more. There will be no more crying, nor pain, nor any more. The former things will pass away and the new will come. Satan, I don't even know why you tried that. And then the next day, if temptation comes, guess what I do? You go back to the Word. You go back to the Word every single time. Every single time. You draw near to the Lord. 
And guess what he'll do? He'll draw near to you. And by doing that, you resist the devil because you're drawing close to God. You can't draw close to the devil while you're drawing close to God. They're, they're too different. You draw close to God. He will draw near to you. By doing that, you're resisting the devil. And guess what? He will flee. Will flee. The Holy Spirit is inside of you convicting you of sin. Now we can say no to our sin. That is one of the greatest, most profound things the Holy Spirit actually has done for us. And most people don't really kind of allow for that to just permeate in their lives. And we have to. We have to be changed by the word, by the gospel. Listen when the Spirit of God is speaking to us. And let him change who we are. And we see, and you will receive power, Acts 1-8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Judea was a very small area. Samaria was a smaller area, was another small area, but with the other people. You know, those the unwashed masses, all right? Judea is our people. Samaria is the other people. And then to the ends of the earth, of course, encompasses everything. And Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, I'll be with you to the ends of the age. The Holy Spirit is helping us have a guarantee of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is convicting us of sin. And the Holy Spirit also empowers us to witness to our neighbors. Now that empowerment looks, there's all kinds of ways that empowerment can look. It can look as in direct gifts, as in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It can look as, as direct gifts. It can look as somewhat passive gifts. Uh, one kind of, to me, kind of seems like a passive gift, but is in uh, 2 Timothy 1.6. It says, for this reason, I remind you to fan the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, which means timidity of being afraid to share a faith, but of power and love and of self-control. A part of the Holy Spirit's work is giving us this grit that we need in order to go minister the gospel to the world. That's a part of what he does. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see, now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. Remember, it's all coming from one place. There are a variety of services, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in all. There are great gifts. There are services that you can fulfill. You know, when you're serving, and you would never have done this when you're not saved. <laughs> you would never have reached out. And yet, somehow... You feel this need, this unction to serve your fellow man. That is by the Spirit of God leading you. It is not by your flesh. Your flesh wants nothing to do with helping anyone. Okay, that's the way the flesh is designed. Me, my, I'm my God. And yet the Spirit of God changes it all. There's services, there's activities, but it's the same God who empowers it all in to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now that's understanding like whatever it is, each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit. For the common good, all these are empowered by one the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now within those that framework of Scripture, not all of you are going to have the same giftings as every single one of you. Now, to be quite honest, it'd be a little bit straightforward if just everyone had all the giftings all the time. However, as a body that we are demonstrated in 1 Corinthians being, we're a body. The toe has a very different function than the eye. Okay? The liver has a different function than the brain. The lungs have a different function than the heart. And yet, if you're missing any of those, it's pretty inconvenient. Not that you can't live, but it is a great inconvenience. All of you are different members of the body. All of you have your own different giftings and abilities and situations that God has even put you in for different services, activities. 
and yet don't feel unaccomplished if you say, well, that person over there seems to have a lot of cool stuff, and they just can speak, they're not scared, nothing like that. Hey, that could be someone who has spent time letting the Spirit of God lead them in their giftings. And yet, maybe we're a little timid, and maybe you need some boldness, but yet, don't be timid or afraid or maybe even discouraged if you feel like you can't do much, because you can. The Spirit of God has empowered each one of us and has been given a manifestation of the Spirit in some way. Now, that could be up to you to kind of discover what that way is, but there's also kind of ways we can help you through that. And yet... The Spirit of God is powerful, pulling down strongholds in people's lives. We have the message that we can share. 1 Corinthians 13 says, above all things, just love people. He said, that's the, great, that's the greatest gift of all. And yet, he still even gives us gift through our love, through our compassion. And that it could be up to you to say, hey, Lord, how do you want to use me today? What do you want to use me today? How do you want to develop me as a Christian, as a follower of you, as someone who is engaged in discipleship and, and evangelism? What is it that you want me to do? That's what we're going to pray for today. We're going to pray that the Lord would fill you up again with the Spirit. There's sometimes in Acts, uh, specifically like Peter, we see that there's different moments where the Spirit of God just kind of washes over us afresh, washes over us, helps us to, you know, one of those moments where you just have to take a moment and say, Lord, I just need you to help me, Father, to stop being timid, to stop being fearful, to be, have no anxiety, or whatever it could be. Lord, can you just fill me again with your spirit? Fill me all over again. It's not he leaves you like the Old Testament comes back, but sometimes you can just be going and doing your own thing, and the Holy Spirit just is set back. Now, that's not the way the Christian life is designed. It's designed for you to be active, sharper, just like the Word of God, and using the Word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword, helping those in darkness see the light. And yet, sometimes, we can be going on mundane through our jobs, through our situations, we wash our clothes, we're planting our gardens, we're sitting down to rest, and we kind of forget that the Lord is powerful and mighty and lives within us. So today, I want to call Tim, and I want to call uh, Chris, if you'll come up here as well, to pray with us. And I want to open up these altars. I want to open up these altars to pray for a fresh filling of the Spirit of God. If you are feeling timid, or maybe you say, hey, I just want to be prayed for, just period. That's fine, too. If you have an ailment, that's fine. But I want to pray with you today that the Spirit of God would just refill you up. That the Lord would refresh you today. That he would remind you, maybe, somehow, of the vigor that you once had. And maybe life has got you down. Maybe life has worn you out. Maybe you've been discouraged by something. What, whatever it is. We're going to forget all that stuff, and we're going to say, Lord, what new thing do you have for me in 2024? What do you have for me that would be different, that would be powerful, that would pull down strongholds? What is it in our lives that you would do for us today? I want you to pray. I want you to come down, and I want you to be focused. Say, Lord, what is it right now today in 2024 that you would have me to do? Who are my neighbors? Who am I going to be speaking to? Who am I going to be ministering to? Lord, fill me up. Empower me today. Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, help me. In Jesus' name. And I want to be the first one. Because I've grown weary. It's tiring. But I want to go for, I want to, for Chris and Tim to pray for me as the pastor. And then I'm going to go lead in worship. 
And I want you to have the altars open. I want you to come down. I want you to pray. Chris and Chris and Tim are going to pray with you that you would be refilled with the Spirit of God. I want to be the first and pray for you.